what I don't think has gotten enough attention is when schools sports resumed, there were hundreds of outbreaks associated with sporting events. Each outbreak in turn had hundreds of cases associated with it. And I think that and the spring break travel were probably the biggest factors for this last surge. The preliminary evidence so far does show that uh, the currently the circulating variant is what we know as the UK variant or the B117, and the current FDA-approved vaccines that we have now are showing efficacy against uh, th- that particular variant. So, um, yeah, so far that's what we know. Wonderful. So you're seeing that the vaccine, the vaccines that we're using, are having efficacy or being being. Um successful in against the uh, variant so far the, the the variant that's currently predominant in our in our uh, environment right now now there are other variants of concern that we know about and certain studies have shown that they're less effective but still they are effective still even at a lesser capacity okay so against the main variant that we're seeing it is fairly effective Mm -hmm. there are other less pervasive variants at this time that we have seen that they're not it's not as effective but for the but it is still effective correct okay wonderful thank you dr donna kumar tell us what is happening in the in the uh, emergency department what are you seeing who's coming in what are the symptoms yeah so for the past few weeks we've seen a, a surge in patients coming in uh, we're seeing the, a younger population than we were seeing before, like last year, last spring. So now we're seeing 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds, and 50-year-olds coming in with COVID-type symptoms. The main uh, symptoms are shortness of breath, cough, generalized body aches and pain. The thing that's different now, most of them are not being hospitalized or they're not going to the ICU. So definitely the, uh, the death rate, mortality rate has come down significantly. Uh, but the positivity rate has gone up. Uh, the past week or so, we've seen a decline, which is good. Um, but uh, the past month, it's been, uh, we did have a surge in Michigan. All right, so shortness of breath is one of the main symptoms. And while they're coming into the ED, they're not getting admitted to the ICU as frequently. Correct, correct. Okay, that's great. That's great to hear. Um, Dr. Cunningham, of course, we like to direct all of our questions about kids to you, given that you're a pediatrician. Um, Talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, what precautions should parents be taking as they look to to take their kids on play dates, go to the parks, um, you know, start to be engaged with sports. What are some of the things that parents should be doing or or caregivers, adult caregivers or kids should be doing to keep our kids safe? The first thing I would do is I'd encourage vaccination for kids 16 and over. The Pfizer COVID vaccine is approved down to that age. I do expect within the next month or so that we're gonna see the Pfizer vaccine approved for even younger ages down to 12. Uh, Pfizer did already submit their data to the FDA for that group and it looked quite promising, quite well tolerated. The main thing for kids, I do think playing outside is safer than playing inside. Again, hand washing, if your kids are sick, please don't send them out. If they're going to be really close together, especially indoors, masks are still advised if kids will tolerate it. Uh, Kids under two rarely will wear a mask. It's not a good idea because they could choke on it. Under five years of age, I find it hard for kids to wear their masks for any prolonged periods of time. But above that age, that's probably our most effective uh, tool we have. We have a mandate for uh, children under the age of two, two and up to wear masks. Talk to us a little bit about why that might have been mandated. What's some of the rationale behind it? I think the reason it was mandated because we do know masks help to decrease transmission. Young kids are not able to get a vaccine at this time against COVID. And I think that was the intent behind the mandate. However, I think as a pediatrician, I'm not convinced it's gonna be very practical to implement. Mm There was some conversation that I'd heard with people saying, well, you know, if you think about who's getting the, who's sort of, we're seeing getting COVID as Dr. Nandakumar said, as a parent, you know, people in their thirties and forties, they may have kids who are of that age. So potentially it's to sort of help that back and forth. Is there any validity to that? Absolutely. But even though kids don't get COVID their symptoms tend to be a lot more mild. There are still a significant number of kids who wind up in the hospital from COVID. Some of them can have very 
serious complications, especially there's this missile, this inflammatory syndrome, which can follow COVID infection by a few weeks. It's a generalized uh, inflammation in the body. Those kids can be pretty sick. So we do want to stop it as much as possible. Thank you. Um, Dr. Cruz, since your specialty is infectious disease, could you tell us a little bit about the virus itself? Um, how long does it live on surfaces? And, and, and uh, you know, we've heard about wearing masks and washing our hands. What else do we need to do as a part of our regular life to keep us from, you know, getting affected? So in terms of your first question about how long the virus lives on surfaces. So it varies from surface to surface. They did various studies, whether on paper, on wood, on steel. So it ranges from a few hours to several days. But the key thing is um, the transmissibility from fomites or from surfaces they've found are like is likely to be low. The main mode of transmission still is through respiratory droplets. So from person to person in closed spaces. So again, um, thinking about that, the important thing is to try to uh, stick to the public health measures that we've always been um, reminding people, which is social distancing and washing of hands. So even if it's in the surfaces, if you are mindful about hand hygiene, then that's certainly a means of preventing spread through that um, method. Okay, so that's very important. You're saying that it can live on surfaces and for certain surfaces up to a few days, but the likelihood of spreading it is still higher in terms of just breathing it in yes, and, and hand hygiene. Yeah, because if you have like, if your hand is in contact with the surface with the COVID virus, you would have to put your hand on your face. And that would be like the, the mode by which the, the virus is... Uh, that you get infected with the virus, but that's low as compared to the respiratory droplet transmission. Okay, so what you're telling me is that the fact that I wash my hands every four to five minutes, <laughs> probably keeping me safe. Might be drying out my hands a bit, but it's keeping me safe. <laughs> okay, that's really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Nanda Kumar, as we think about um, the vaccines and we've sort of heard that they have a six month, we're thinking six months of, um, you know, effectiveness, what do you think is going to happen about six months after we've had, you know, most of our people vaccinated, which coincidentally is going to be right before school starts? Do we expect another surge? You know, what are, what are you preparing for in the ED? Well, I think it'll be similar to what happened last year. Last summer, we had a plateau, things leveled off, but then we had a surge in the fall. And now, um, as Dr. Kuzi mentioned, there's other variants out there. And uh, specifically the South African variant, if that comes here and becomes a problem, we're definitely going to have another surge. Uh, the summertime, people are going to be out and about. There's going to be more traveling. Kids will be in camp. So uh, we're definitely uh, expecting a surge to happen in the fall. And uh, everything that I've read and uh, looked into, probably all going to need a, a booster vaccine uh, this fall. Definitely the high risk patients, so you know, 50 and 60 year olds and over with the other health issues will definitely need a booster. And same with uh, all the first responders, physicians and whatnot will need, uh, will most likely need a booster also. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Cunningham, is that how Henry Ford's also preparing for sort of something similar? Well, I, I will say we know the vaccine gives good protection for at least six months. The manufacturers have an ongoing study to measure antibodies and volunteers. They're looking at the nine month data right now. So I think we're gonna certainly have a longer than six months protection. I agree with the booster doses. It's probably gonna be booster doses like influenza where every year it's tweaked a little bit to get whatever strains are currently circulating. If we can get to about 50% of our population vaccinated, we can really halt COVID. Israel had great success doing that when they got to 50% of people having two doses, the number of cases dropped dramatically as they got even higher. COVID essentially is almost gone right now from that country. So we can get there, but people need to still wear the mask, the social distancing until everyone has the vaccine or until we have a lot more people with the vaccine. My concern is we have plenty of vaccine, far more than people who want to get vaccinated. And that's, um, that just means we're going to be dealing with COVID and these little outbreaks more and more. And I, you know, if we can talk a little bit more about that, and, and I welcome any of you to sort of answer this, then I know we've got questions from the audience as well, but you know, we have a significant, we have a section of the population who is, is not comfortable getting vaccinated, is not choosing to get vaccinated right now for a variety of reasons. Can we talk a little bit about why 
that's important and how that, as you just said, Dr. Kram, we're going to keep dealing with COVID. Can you explain a little bit about why? Why is that the case? Well, if enough people have been vaccinated or infected, they're protected against another infection. They'll have some protection. Now, strain, different strains can make this a whole nother ball game, but as long as there's people who are susceptible, as the infection spreads, more and more people get sick, they give it to other people. If we can get people vaccinated, that's our best bet to get this virus under control and stop transmission in our community. Without more people getting vaccinated, I think we're gonna have these COVID surges where every six to 12 weeks, we're gonna have another spike in the number of hospital admissions, uh, just gonna keep going on and on. And that's really what concerns me the most. Our healthcare workers are tired. Uh, the amount of stress and work that they've been doing is incredible and they really need a break. So could you talk a little bit about um, folks that end up getting COVID even though they've been vaccinated and, and should you still get vaccinated even though you could still get COVID? I actually track the numbers of COVID patients in Henry Ford employees after vaccination. I can tell you we've had 58 employees who had COVID after both doses of the vaccine. That's roughly a 0.28% of vaccinated people. Uh, they're all very mild illnesses doing great. When I compare it to the employees who chose not to get the vaccine, if you didn't get the vaccine, their chance of getting COVID are 25 times higher than the vaccinated group. And those are the employees who are sicker, wind up in the emergency department or the hospital. Uh, CDC just came out this week and they said it, for the adults over 65, I believe that if you're vaccinated, um, decreased hospitalization rate by 94%, which is an incredible number. So no vaccines 100%, but you're never gonna get something that's gonna give 100%. This vaccine is far more effective than some vaccines we use like flu. To me, it's a no brainer that you should get this vaccine. I received it, my family has received it, and I'm just a big believer in it. You can find more at OneDetroitPBS.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter.